A Living Doll by Fiona Dobson, read by Jules Sanderson. I entered the house, a little surprised that my keys still worked. Evelyn had been threatening to change the locks, on and off, for months. Our marriage was not exactly a smooth path. We were in the middle of yet another trial separation when the lockdown came into effect. Perhaps you've noticed the special silence of an empty house. You'll know it if you've ever been divorced. It's not merely the absence of sound. It's the lack of noise where once there had been a couple. Random sounds. Meals being prepared. It's the special hollowness of life gone out of a place. But this was different. And then it hit me like a bat in the face. I knew that smell well enough. I had last smelled that in Africa. It was the rich, heavy smell of death, the throat-clogging smell of corruption. I decided it would be better to call the police than to push ahead. Evelyn had not answered my calls for the past week, and now I realised it was not her obstructive nature at play. She had not answered her calls for an altogether more permanent reason. I told the emergency operator that I thought there was a dead body in the house, and then sat and waited in the garden. To think she'd asked me to leave three weeks ago, and we'd not spoken since then. This damn pandemic and lockdown had made our separation all the more horrible to manage. Yet now, I realise, her refusal to answer calls was not motivated by the same cruel motives she'd applied to our marriage these last few years. No, this was something else altogether. The police and ambulance arrived within half an hour. I'd spent that time in the garden, at first sitting and then tidying up the mess that it had become. I suppose it all looked a bit incongruous. Fall leaves everywhere. I thought about how it must look to the officers who came in through the garden gate. Don't mind me, I'm just cleaning up the mess in the garden. There's a body in the house, I think. No, no, that wouldn't do. I think there's something wrong. I thought I should call you, I said. The officers entered the house and I waited. Within a few minutes, the youngest of the two came out looking a bit pale. You'd best not go in there, sir, he said, and then nodded to the ambulance men who shuffled into the hallway, awkwardly carrying the stretcher. There were questions. Why was she left alone? Where were you, Mr. Valentine? When did you last see your wife? Was there any particular reason for your separation? I understood the thrust of the questions, but I'd been staying with my brother and working remotely. My presence, seventy miles away for the last three weeks, was very easily verified. There was little doubt what had happened. It was another Covid death, in which the victim was so weakened by the virus that their reluctance to reach out for medical help was succeeded by the onset of gradual lung failure and exhaustion. With no one here to help, she had simply fallen into first sleep and then a coma. And here we were. And then the body was brought out, a sheet over her face. I understood the body had swollen and was not pleasant to look at. It was not cold weather. There had also been insect damage, as the officer put it. They paused before putting it into the vehicle. Did I wish to identify the body? I weighed up how I wished to remember Evelyn. Would it be that last look of her shouting at me as she slammed the door behind me, or would it be the putrefied foreman ambulance pulling back the sheet, revealing a fly-blown face? I waved the ambulance men on, and they put their load into the back of their vehicle. It pulled away. Lights off. I spent the next few days at my brother's house. I'd left the upstairs windows of our place open to clear the smell, and when I returned a week later, armed with cleaning materials, air sprays, and several dustbin liners to toss out bedding and other bits and pieces, I reflected on the fact that I had outlived my wife, my marriage, and that I was now a widow. Cleaning the house out was a matter of disposing of the debris of our marriage. I left her room until last. We'd not shared a room in the last five years. She kept odd hours, and we found it worked better for us to use separate rooms, as our sleep patterns were very different. I would sometimes wake in the middle of the night to hear her moving about at three in the morning. I'd hear the chanting, quietly but repetitively, sometimes hour after hour. Yes, she was a little odd, I know that. But then, I'm a little odd myself. To say Evelyn was a little odd possibly doesn't do it justice. 
She held some unusual spiritual beliefs, and my work as a surveyor gave her plenty of opportunity to indulge and explore these things. Working for the oil company, I would often be posted to remote locations, accompanied by my dear wife, during which she would disappear happily, sometimes for hours, and later, sometimes for days, during which she would be immersed in the local cultures and spiritual practices. It was more than a hobby for Evelyn. She had studied anthropology at university, and her special area had been primitive spirituality. So extensive was her knowledge that to this day her book, Roots of Human Belief, is required reading for several anthropology courses. So it was with some trepidation that I opened the desk that stood in the corner of her bedroom. There were reams of handwritten notes in her tight little script and a few items of stationery. A large locked drawer defied my attempts to force it open, but I carefully stacked the papers, the thought of disposing of them out of the question. Instead I packed them into boxes to be stored. The stationery and the clippings from magazines could go, but her writing was something different. It would be like disposing of part of her, and I just couldn't do that. Evelyn was not what you'd think of as a normal wife. We'd married shortly after the death of my first wife. Yes, I'm double widowed. That's probably not something I plan to mention on my dating profile. She had been a temp at the company head office. On returning from a field trip to make rough drawings of a proposed installation site in the Caribbean, Evelyn had latched on to me. I say it a little coldly, as I hadn't really been looking for a partner at the time. Life wasn't e easy with Stephen, my young son, and being posted to far-flung realms between my dead wife's sister and my parents, we managed to keep Stephen well cared for, but it wasn't until an opportunity came to work on a longer-term project that I really spent much time with my son. I was sent to Ishmaelia that fateful spring, and shortly afterwards Evelyn appeared. She was supposed to be visiting the corporate office in the capital, and we ended up first dating, and then a couple, and then married. Living as expats, we shared a life of comparative luxury, compared to what we could expect in London, and from time to time Evelyn would come with me on trips up country. It was on one such trip that she met Ashwali, the shaman. Of course she'd met many shaman, but Ashwali was different. I was working on selecting the site for a pumping station for the company. It was an ill-fated project from the start, the independence movement being so strong in the coastal provinces. I knew from early in the process that it would never be built. But like many of us in the country office, I just carried on as though the political situ situation in the country were going to stabilise, though no one who was remotely connected to the local population would really think that that were the case. I would trudge around the local hilltops with my theodolite, a compass and binoculars, mapping the local terrain, and Evelyn would spend the cool of the early mornings with Ashwali, talking endlessly about local customs and rituals. She even learned some of the tribal language, which was quite different from the Swahili the locals in the capital spoke. The equatorial heat made the afternoon quite hopeless to work in. We'd usually retire, retire shortly after lunch for a quiet afternoon in the shade before I'd carry on about my duties in the cool of the early evening. That particular day, Evelyn had not returned for lunch, which was not unusual in itself, but when she'd not shown up after I'd risen for the evening round of measurements and bearing recordings, I began to get a little concerned. By the time darkness was falling, I was concerned. There'd been some insecurity in the surrounding hill country, and there were rumours that the local rebel fighters might make a bid to capture the capital. I'd heard such things before, but it seemed very unlikely. All the same, I was concerned for Evelyn, and took the Land Rover into the village and found the chief's compound. Have you seen the Memsab? I asked, knowing nothing happened in the village without the chief knowing about it. In reply, he smiled ingratiatingly and pointed towards the hilltop to the south, where a telltale column of grey smoke was drifting across the landscape. Twenty minutes later... I was pressing the unforgiving suspension of the vehicle to its limits, bouncing slowly up an unmade track towards the hilltop. There I found Evelyn and Ashwali, sitting by a small campfire, chanting and rocking. They both appeared to be in a trance-like state and unaware of me. I watched for a while, and then decided that whatever this ritual was, I shouldn't interrupt it. 
I went for a smoke on the side of the hill and watched the sun set. I can remember feeling a sense of great relief that I'd found Evelyn, but once found felt the moment of danger had passed, and so relaxed, and just enjoyed that quiet and almost mystical moment of the African dusk. It wasn't until much later that I was to learn how wrong that sense of relief had been. I'll post part two of this tomorrow.